or good evening. Um, we have uh, seen several rock stars over the past uh, couple of days, couple of weeks. Uh, David Bowie, Glenn Fry, and particularly in our world with AI, Marvin Minsky passed away on Sunday, I believe, up in Boston. And, and so it's kind of interesting that we're sitting here and we're having a conversation about artificial intelligence or um, machine learning as a, a way to implement that. And so um, what I'd like to do is a couple of things. One, this is not going to be a highly technical talk filled with PowerPoints that contain in-depth equations and example trees. What I'd like to do is to keep this interactive, if at all possible and have an opportunity to just share and listen. The second thing I'd like to do, and I'd like to accomplish as we leave here today, is um, to get folks thinking about what artificial intelligence is, more so than just machine learning as a method for implementing it. Now, to help me out for a second, how many folks here are actively working with some form of machine learning to accomplish their day-to-day -day job? Okay. How many are here then basically just out of an interest? Okay. Okay. And so let's start with the uh, full disclosure. I saw this when I was a student taking a course in the Civil War in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania from an instructor who started the course off saying, I am a Yankee. I'm going to teach from that perspective. And you owe it to yourself someday to uh, to hear from someone down south. And so you know a little bit about me, or just a little bit about how I'm going to um, move forward with this talk. There are no new ideas. Um, there is the binary computer. How many of you are familiar with genetics? I have a coffee mug, and it says uh, the genetic spelling bee, G-C-C-A-T, chicken. So <laughs> those of you that are aware but if you think about it for a second, Alan Turing talked about, his name will come up again, that we can express any program as a tape, and we'll march along this tape and be able to execute. When we take a look at the way that the genetic code works, we read off of the DNA, producing proteins that are then used to transmit information multiple times as they fold. So a lot of the techniques that we use, we really um, and by the way, the genetic code, they match in pairs. So it is a binary code that exists. So in, in many ways, the, the work that we do in terms of creating programs that we hope will simulate intelligence will follow that. Patterns just make sense. You know, we're going to walk out of this room. We're going to hit the down button on the elevator, although they're a little bit more advanced than this. And we expect the pattern being when we hit down that that's the direction the elevator is going to go. And that allows for some simplifying um, assumptions. And so I can begin handling some complex situations through a context of simplified rules and assumptions. The second thing, and this is very important in trading. Martin said this a little earlier. He talked about What's a trade? Well, it's two people coming together and agreeing on a price. Now, the agreement of the price holds back some assumptions, and each party is hopefully getting the better deal for, for some perspective they might have. And so people are fascinated. And when we set up trading systems, we are really working with people. We tend to be exceptionally creative. How many in here have been around kids, especially young kids? Um, they are exceptionally creative at getting what they want. Uh, they tend to be creatures of habit. People tend to behave in predictable ways. However, people are capable of leaving the box on their own volition. That means somebody can come up with some really good ideas. I imagine many of you in here have been tasked at some point or another to solve something that you've never been tasked to solve before. And so all of that innovation comes from our ability to step outside of the box and sort of alternatives. And finally, we have an insatiable desire to be understood. I'd like to know what you all are thinking. 
kind of would like to know what it is I'm trying to communicate. It's very important to me to make sure that what I leave you with today will help you understand and perhaps do something a little differently when you start on your task list tomorrow. And so, you know, the title of the talk was um, Rational Reverence, Sharp Razor. And so let's talk about what rational means. I promise I stay in front of the mic. People will do things that are in their best interest. And the question becomes, what is best interest? But if I'm going to go into a competitive situation, you and I are going to trade something, but I'm going to assume you're going to be out there looking for the best advantage from you. And I'll do the same on my own. We can defer immediate gain for a bigger gain in the future. I can go ahead and take a dollar that I would have gone to McDonald's and bought a large iced tea with and put it in the bank in the hopes of earning half a percent interest in 10 years. Why I would do that, I have no idea. But I do have the ability to balance that. And then finally the model breaks. And statistically, you know, Martin talked about we look for those gaps. But there are some people that are selfish. Selfless, excuse me. They will do, they will give, they will behave in a way that is non-rational. And then there are others that are hyper-rational. They just don't care. To the point of chaotic. They will go and they will do things within the market or within a situation that are unpredictable. And so as we talk about machine learning, we talk about building a system that's capable of being rational, not only for its own behavior, but being able to anticipate the behavior of others. And so if people are so complicated, imagine what artificial intelligence will look like. Who's Gene Roddenberry? Anybody? Star Trek. Matter of fact, one of the episodes he created had the first um, indication of silicon-based life. Anybody remember what the name of that silicon-based life was? Go way back, Trekkies knew the Horta. That was the whole thing that, that, that was silicon-based life. For those of us trying to do it inside of a chip, we've been beaten. Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, through their writing. Um, Isaac Asimov was very fascinating. I had the opportunity to hear him speak one time. He is a trained scientist, but he gave us the laws of robotics. He gave us the concept of what rational behavior would be. Steven Spielberg, George Lucas gave us C-3PO, R2-D2, and a world full of things that might be considered artificial intelligence. The last name is the creative mind behind the TV show, Jonathan Nolan. Does anyone know the TV show he's created? Person of Interest. Who are the two main characters right now in Person of Interest? One is an AI called The Machine. The other is an AI called Samaritan. And they are doing battle for world domination. And that might seem somewhat irrelevant, except for the fact that you have got folks at Davos over the past week talking about how unbridled artificial intelligence is going to destroy us or the world as we know it. And so how are we going to know when we have actually had machine learning implemented to actually build artificial intelligence? Well, Alan Turing gave us the Turing test, which means if you take a person and put a screen in front of them and have them interact with what's behind the screen, will they know whether it's a human being or will it be a robot or an artificial intelligence? Sounds interesting, but from the perspective of what we're talking about, it's the human being. It would be if I was sitting and there was a screen and it was Warren Buffett or an AI with respect to a hedge fund. Would I be able to tell the difference? And so in terms of figuring out ways to be able to implement machine learning, how are we going to do this so that we can step up to and work with the small number of people that are managing this large amount of money? And I'm not so sure. It's those of us that come at it 
from uh, computer science or engineering or physics or necessarily a math-based background that are going to get there first. I have a strong suspicion that the neuroscientists that are doing work in functional uh, pet and are running the rats around the mazes and are beginning to take a look at the impact of chemical changes on behavior of various things will actually get there before those of us that are building models that have some predictive value get there. So rational. And now how are we going to distill these observations into code? Sir William of Ockham, Ockham's razor. How many are familiar with the term? Which is very simply this. It means if given a, a group of models, I'm going to choose the one that has got the simplest set of assumptions. Speaking to Martin's point a little bit earlier, I'm trying to avoid overfitting. I would like a system that's resilient in the face of change. And then games. We love to play games. Actually, well, I, I feel the need to say vicariously because of a small sporting event that's coming to this part of the world <laughs> over the weekend. Um, and we'll bet on anything. So if we're going to go into a market-based idea, we're going to implement trades, I'm going to bet that my knowledge, or however I have gained that, will have some advantage over the person that I'm betting against. And then a very interesting idea when we talk about simplicity in game playing is one of the best strategies out there is tit for tat. Do it sometime. Play tic-tac-toe with someone, and if they choose one corner with an X, you put a no in the other corner. So basically, you're going to mirror your opponent's move. But this very simple type of an algorithm or algorithmic response will do quite well in a lot of scenarios. So armed with this background, a few years ago, I had a PhD advisor that he didn't have a lot of the students, but every one of the students that he had, he sent us to go after market data and try to predict, um, predict the stock market. Now, I can tell you that we were successful in the sense we graduated with our PhDs, but I guess if we, any of us were truly successful, we would not have our PhDs. We would have gone back to the gentleman's answer back here, which is we would have forgotten the PhD, taken our model someplace, and if, you know, maybe endowed a chair at the school or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm required by my foundation people to, to put ideas like that out there. But when I was doing my work, I was also very fortunate to be raising four small kids at home. And I had several of those kids in a Montessori program. And the Montessori program, um, Maria Montessori in France many years ago, they've now backed it up with a lot of neuroscience, and they call it brain-based learning. And these are the ten tenets, distilled very cheaply. But they talk about the way our brains function. So if we're going to talk about artificial intelligence or possibly using machine learning or statistical machine learning techniques to build something that is backed up or will reason like you and I might reason, here are some of the things that happen. I'm not going to read the list, but notice there are some things in there that are beyond just the ability to learn, recognize patterns, and act on them. There's some sense of the physical. Yeah, yeah. At some point, do we get frustrated? Do we have models that they'll work for so long and then they're going to quit working? The brain changes. We have the ability, we're resilient, we can learn. The arts are important. You know, sometimes our background knowledge and context leads us to look at problems in an interesting way. When I started, my dissertation work was balancing currency portfolios. When I graduated, the first papers I published were predicting outcomes of patients that showed up in an emergency room with chest pain, and whether or not 30 days later they were going to have some kind of a major coronary event. Same basic data mining and machine learning models applied to a different set of data. Emotional states. A student do something that was very interesting in terms of game playing. How many are familiar with the game Texas Hold'em? 
the, the betting that takes place around the table is very interesting. So is the fact that we sat around on a Friday afternoon in my office with chips on the table and played poker for three or four hours, hoping the dean would not arrive. But what the student was trying to understand as he took copious notes was how could he discern emotional behavior from the way people bet? And it was interesting. Somebody that was betting sort of steady that had lost three or four hands in a row, all of a sudden we get aggressive. And so that had, to Barnes' point, that had nothing to do with rational behavior, but it was an emotional state. And then memories are malleable. Our models that we have, in the, whenever we bring a memory, dredge it back up from the back of our minds, we have an opportunity to possibly modify that memory before it goes back into deep storage. What would that look like if we were going to go ahead and build some type of an artificial intelligence? And so, how do we model children learning to play? Well, the Reverend Thomas Bates wrote a letter to a friend, and it, he just read the sources. One source will tell you he was talking about playing billiards. If I drop a ball on the table, and then I drop another ball on the table, and if I tell you whether it's to the left or the right, do I know where that first ball is? Now, if I have a constrained space, and I drop enough balls, each time I get a new piece of evidence, I will go ahead and I will change my behavior. The human brain will start by, if we're going to work with a new concept, we will build a large interconnected net. And then as we repeat what we're doing, we begin pruning away pieces of that net, is how we will learn. And so what I like, or why I prefer to use Bayesian networks as my form of, of higher level learning is the fact that it's probability based. And so it allows me to account for the fact that although I assume my opponent is rational, that opponent might not be rational. The other thing that I like to do is I like, I adhere to Dempster Schaefer, so I will get a probability of something, but I will also get a belief as to whether that's true. You and I are going to play a game based on flipping a coin. We'll start with the belief the coin is fair. Half of the time heads, half of the time tails. If I start seeing the coin um, coming up so that it's more heads to their advantage, then my belief that he's going to bring, or someone's going to bring a fair coin to me is going to start going down. So it allows me to take a look at not only what the patterns are saying, but how strongly I believe those patterns are going to continue to exist. Laplace is actually the one that we ought to be given credit to in terms of what we understand as the Bayes formula. It was attributed to Bayes, but it was really a lot of the work done by Laplace. And then as he did this, he began looking at large frequency counts, and he developed the central limit theorem, and he somewhat moved away from the Bayesian theorem that we know and love. Last question. Well, not last question, but why a Bayesian belief that and not a neural net. How many people here are familiar with Bayesian networks? Start with that. Neural networks. Okay. So I would work in the medical domain. And it was kind of funny. They would throw a white coat on me. They'd drag me through the emergency room and say, I'd like you to meet Dr. Nova Bilski. I guess it was all technically correct, um, but I'm sure glad nobody asked me for, for any help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea being is I'm working with domain experts. When is the last time you've tried to show the inner workings of a neural network to someone and have them tell you whether or not it makes sense? However, when I use data mining to produce Bayesian networks, I could do two things with my physician colleagues. One, I could let them sit there and press the buttons. And so they would understand, and they could tell me from the basis of their experience whether or not the inferencing that was going on within that network made sense. The other interesting point, and this is one of the things having to do with machine learning in a data mining environment, 
is there was an arrow between two uh, medical conditions that they're taught in med school, influencing goes one way, but the, the algorithm showed it going the other way. It was something strange, and I pointed it out to the doctor, and he said, well, medical school will tell you that's wrong, but current evidence is coming back saying that arrow is actually, you know, the, the mining algorithm produced it correctly. So we now have the ability in a trading system, I could sit down with a model that was built this way and go to a human behaviorist and say, does this make sense to you? Or in the case of what Quantiax is doing, um, if it was me submitting a model, and in, in full disclosure, I have submitted a model to this. I'm fascinated by this type of an opportunity, and I'll explain that a little bit later on. Um, if for some reason it took off and it did really well, I would have the ability to then go and talk to Martin's investor. That question came up and said, yes, I can show you what's going on underneath it. It's sort of the equivalent of me asking my son, why did you do that? <laughs> I get a more rational answer, I'm sure, from the uh, Bayesian network than I tend to get from him. So amazing. I talked a little bit about this, how the tools that used to forecast medical outcomes will work to forecast market outcomes. We really are, in some sense, data agnostic. We will use these techniques, we will build agents to learn from the data and produce desired outcomes. Um, and if you think that medical data just is freight train information, uh, soups referred to area under the curve, it's a common nomenclature with receiver operator, operator characteristic curves, and ROC curves can be used to rank and rate uh, different algorithms against each other. But what's interesting with respect to heart attack is the most expensive thing a doctor can do is um, hold somebody for observation playing with chest pain. And the most expensive lawsuit that the doctor's malpractice will defend against is when the doctor has released the patient after they've complained of chest pain. And that patient has then had an adverse coronary event. And so by using the ROC curve, we can actually look at the inflection point and decide when we should hold somebody, when, when it's cost effective to hold somebody versus when it would be cost effective if they were to go home and something adverse were to happen. Very cold. But we are, in essence, hedging our bets in terms of how we want to invest those healthcare dollars. And so as we're using this type of a model to build an environment or a way to say, I'm going to invest so many dollars and I'm going to allocate it a certain way, I'm going to hedge that based on a set of assumptions I learned from market data. Now our brain will work, I'm not a neuroscientist, um, so, but I like to simplify things down a good bit. We basically operate on two levels. There's a part of our brain that processes raw sensor input and does things like say, that's hot, now don't touch it, it's cold, it's windy, it's humid. And then there's another part of our brain that builds up networks to help make decisions. And so we'll be able to use the sensor input in different ways. So for example, I walk outside and I'm trying to decide whether or not I need an umbrella or I'm trying to decide whether or not to go play tennis and whether or not I'm going to do it indoors or outdoors. I can use the same information to decide whether to bring an umbrella with me or whether to call and cancel my tennis game. Um, so that, that is one area. And that tends to be, or what I would suggest, an area that we can work with unsupervised learning. So the sensory input, how do I quantize data? I can do it maybe k-means. If I have a large range of data and I want to break it down to two or three categories or n categories just using a little bit of supervised learning on top of it, but I can go ahead and set up so I have a set of raw discrete variables that I throw things into these bins. And that helps me computationally, but it also simplifies the model. And if I can keep the model simple, I'm adhering to Occam's razor and I'm happy. 
And there are a lot of different algorithms that can be used. K-means is just a very simple one. The second is the decision network function of the brain, the gray matter, that's normally attributed to the gray matter. I'll go ahead and implement using a, a Bayesian belief network. They can be fairly expensive to do inferencing on, especially if they grow large. Sometimes the naive Bayes will work just as well. We'll, we'll make a very simple, we'll make a small assumption that there's no such thing as um, connections between variables except the way they will, are connected or influenced by the variable of interest. And then um, we can look for these models. There are many ways of learning models. Um, in my case, I like to use genetic algorithms. Uh, I like the hand to search that way. Um, that's, by, by the way, a personal bias. Uh, we do search in this manner basically for empty hard problems. Uh, the solution is to try every possible number of infinite solutions simultaneously and you'll wind up with the right one. Um, using correct population sizes within genetic algorithms or genetic programs will let us simulate that. As computational power begins coming up, we'll be able to do a better job with that. And so how do we learn the belief nets? There are a lot of ways of doing it. We can overfit very easily. Um, there are ways, for example, using principal component analysis to figure out there might be 300 variables of interest, but there's only four that are carrying 90% of the signal for what's going on. OK, that's possible. And then we can use that to go ahead and build the networks over time. How well did the system do? We can do single value measures if I want to say whether or not this uh, uh, confusion matrix, whether or not this is a true positive, a false positive, true negative, a false negative, and then the ROC curve evaluation is one way of doing it. And then when is it time to retrain? Now, this is interesting. Okay, how many of you program computers? Okay, so here's a great question. I did this with a, a group of students the first day, and it, it sort of freaked them out. It certainly took more whiteboard than I expected. Yeah. I'm willing to, how many of you in here know more than five computer programming languages? Okay, so about half the room, give or take. Um, if we were to start listing them on the board, I guarantee you, even amongst those of you that know five or more, they're not going to be the same five languages, especially if some of you have played around at the lower level of the machine and you've worked with assembly language. So you've got background, but I guarantee you if you're still in the software business four or five years from now, guess what? You're going to probably know another computer language. We intuitively understand how to do that retraining. Now, sometimes it's forced on us. So in the case of working within the Quantiax framework, we're allowed on a daily basis to tweak our model, redo our model, retrain our model if we so choose. So we have a time stamp or time period that we can work with it. However, perhaps we just want to hold on to a position over multiple days. Maybe I have got a, a, a probability-based planner that's capable of doing that. Now these are things that you and I are fairly good at doing intuitively. Sometimes it's forced on us if we hold some type of a professional licensure. But most of the time, we will spend time reading literature and trying to understand, to Soup's point, what it is that we don't know we don't know and what it is that we don't know that we do know that maybe we need to know more about. So these are, these are part of um, the trading systems that yes, I can work with the fundamental, I can work with the data that I know. But what about the information that's coming at me that's not historical and the information that we're not used to using quite yet? The semantic analysis of news stories, the point of origin of those stories. Who's talking about it? For a long time, if I was interested in what was important in software, I would read all of the trade journals dedicated to hardware and microprocessor development. 
because if there was an article about software that made it into that magazine, I could assume a certain level of importance. Again, we would probably be able to list a lot of different ways that you all do that. How do we put that into a system that will then allow that system to know when it's time to retrain? And then what's missing? How many of you have actually written a model or written code where you have tried to model emotional response as part of the system? Count one, two, and then if we want to count my student back in Chattanooga, we did it um, for the game, that would be three. May I ask if you're willing to share in what context? Sure. Um, where's, where's the who box? Uh, sure, the context was trying to determine whether or not uh, the information that was fed back to an individual about a disease potential would be uh, positive or negative the, um, affecting them as to how they go forward in their life. Uh, as an example, and it's, a, it's not the disease is what we're talking about, but let's say you took a uh, test and you were be able to determine whether or not you had would have Alzheimer's in the future, and you would know when it would hit. And so <coughs> let's say you'd say, okay, um, I have to be 69. So let's say I took that test and it said, when I was 71, um, I would start showing the effect of Alzheimer's. How would I live my life between now and 71? Right. So the questions arose about how people respond to diagnostic information and how that affects treatment in the long term. Okay. That's what I was using. Thank you. There was one other example you're willing to share? I would use the reinforcement learning to see the emotions and subsets. Nothing really interesting like that. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then the other was in terms of gambling. And so, in terms of emotional content for a trading system, how do I model what's going on in the world? So for example, if um, the way trades are done in a sense of peace or relative stability versus if we are you know, watching um, somebody lobbing missiles over somebody else's warships in, in a time of, of not so peaceful behavior. And so, as we're sort of coming to the end, um, what does intelligent mean? You know, what type of machine learning algorithms or statistical algorithms can we build when the game is in zero sum? I mean, a lot of time we assume that if I'm going to sell something to someone, they're going to pay something to me, and at that point in time, value has been established. And if it turns out I was correct, the other person's going to lose. Um, sometimes force majeure just will wipe that out. Um, I will, I, Hurricane Ivan hit the Alabama coast four days after the person that owned the house next to mine on the beach closed on their house. And it just wiped it out. And so whatever value they thought they were going to have was gone. And then there's force to government. Our models are such that if we assume zero sum and the government comes in and prints money, uh, that's an interesting part of the Bitcoin, to tie it back to Bitcoin, where there is no printing of it. It's a fixed market. So the assumptions that work there might not work where governments are going to come in and play with the markets. And as we become increasingly global, whatever systems we develop are going to need to figure out a way to handle these things. And then there are disruptive, techno-ideological interference. I made those words up. The, the fact is, we're trading information a lot quicker. And not only is the information um, available much quicker, but our belief in the accuracy of it. And that doesn't mean it's true or false. It means that we believe we know what the information means. It's coming up. And I think that's changing a lot more rapidly than um, we're used to. What does it mean when we've got competing games that overlap and rational behavior is difficult to understand? 
I might be trying to hedge something in order to protect an investment I have somewhere else and to keep a balanced portfolio growing. I might, you know, if the dollars that Martin was describing a little earlier, uh, I might be in the same space as a government playing a game trying to keep its people somewhat content. Those two games aren't necessarily the same thing, and yet there are elements of them that are overlapping. What does that mean? And, and how do we define what's rational? Yes, everybody's going to behave in their best interest, but it suddenly becomes much more complicated for me to build an agent that models that rational behavior. And then, you know, people continue to evolve, yet remain true to their nature over time. So if we're talking about building trading systems, and it might be me against the machine, or a machine against the machine, or me and another person, in the end, it's, it's really our understanding of what's going on is changing, and we are now becoming to have access to the same amounts of information. And so as we continue to get smarter as human beings, what does that mean in terms of the Turing test? What will it mean? It might have been 20 years ago to sit across or with that screen and be talking to somebody that wasn't Warren Buffett. It was just somebody who could answer questions roughly the same equivalent, a machine, as an average human being, whatever that happens to be. But now I think what we're being driven towards is a lot of expertise available online. How do we build systems and measure their effectiveness in terms of competing against human experts? And so, you can never ever end a talk without talking about what you would like to do next. And so, experience and uh, early childhood ed or childhood educators will tell you this. Um, you take a kid at 10 or 11, and they tend to be open to exploring new ideas. They might not like it, but they'll try it. You know, they'll go skiing. They'll go swimming in the ocean. They'll, um, well, maybe not eat their peas and carrots, but maybe they'll try an ice cream flavor that's not vanilla. It's, it's this idea that they're very open to learning. And so what I'd like to do someday is to take a master teacher that works with grades four and seven and find out what works with these young people at this age. Pedagogy, how do we teach them? What is it about that supervised learning environment that we might be able to carry over as we build intelligent agents? And then how do we measure growth? You know, sometimes we measure growth as success and failure. Um, but sometimes we measure growth by a willingness to just experience. And then the hardest thing I don't know about you, but for me to teach, especially my graduate students, is that while nobody is really pleased to fail, it's not about the fact that you failed, it's about did you get the lesson out of the failure and advance your learning a little bit so you could move forward. And so how do we measure things? We measure things as the sharp ratio on the system. It's a, it's a nice, it's a normalized measurement. <coughs> We understand it, it builds a common context amongst us. Do we measure using the area under the curve for an ROC curve? Well, it provides a normalized understanding of the way that a measurement will differentiate between true and false positives. We need to pick the measurements. Of course, the hardest measurement to pick is the one you don't know is the most effective. And so how do we have systems that are capable picking these measurements out. Um, if you leave a group of kids this age and just tell them to go keep themselves occupied, sometimes they'll form their own clubs or they'll form their own groups and they'll come up with a set of rules, a uh, membership criteria, what's going to happen, how they're going to decide whether the club was a success or not. These are some of the things we need to, to pay attention to as we're building our systems. And then there are a tremendous number of white and gray matter models that make sense in terms of these young people learning. And it goes back to the brain-based learning, but it also works in terms of what we talk with, with machine learning, in terms of neural nets. There are a tremendous number of neural net 
examples. Everybody always thinks, or most folks will think, feed forward, back propagation training is the solution to everything. Um, too bad. And there's some things with support vector machines and, and others that would make sense in certain contexts. Can we build a system that knows how to go and set those up based on what it's trying to solve? And then do we want to use CARP? Do we want to use Bayesian network? Um, any one of a number of more gray matter models that allow us to produce inferencing in a manner that we understand. And so we've got, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and so we'd love to open it up for discussion. If you have questions for Martin, I think now would be a good time to get those on the table. Questions for myself. Um, the top email address is school. The bottom, the uh, second email <coughs> address is uh, my home address forever. And so uh, let's just open it up. Questions? <laughs>